Hi there, welcome to this video about DNA replication. So DNA replication is obviously DNA replicating itself, i.e. making another um, copy of itself. So we know that DNA structure is a double helix. So we can draw our double helix like this. Okay, so we've got two strands, which are just nucleotides joined together. Um, and then we've got the two strands wound together in a spiral, which we call a double helix. Now, we've done about transcription. Now, let me draw your picture and then rub it out. So transcription, we unzipped a little area where the gene started and we copied one of these strands to make a complementary strand, which we called mRNA. So the similarities and differences between DNA replication and transcription. So let's rub out transcription because that's not what we're doing now. We're doing DNA replication, but it's really important that we're familiar with transcription to understand where we might get mixed up. The first difference is that the unzipping part in DNA replication is that we unzip from one end of the DNA. So if we were to draw our DNA wound together, into a chromosome shape joined with a centromere in the middle we know that it's got stripes because it's made of lots of genes yeah if we were to untangle unravel that chromosome it would be a really 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 long oops, uh, double helix okay and sections of that would be a gene and another gene and another gene and in transcription we're just copying one gene at a time now, in DNA replication, we're not copying one gene at a time. We're copying the whole lot. So we can literally just start at one end and unravel from one end to the other end. OK, we don't have to start in the middle like we did in transcription. So the first step is really similar in that we need to break the hydrogen bonds um, between the complementary base pairs in order to... Um, Let's change that font in order to separate the two strands of DNA. So we break hydrogen bonds between the complementary bases. Okay, the enzyme that does that is DNA helicase because it's undoing the helix. Okay, and that starts at one end. Now, here comes the second difference. What we're going to do is we're going to add on new complementary nucleotides. Now, in transcription, we added RNA nucleotides because we were making mRNA. Here, we want to make more DNA. So we're going to add DNA nucleotides, com complementary DNA nucleotides instead of complementary RNA nucleotides. And we're going to add those nucleotides along here remember how we draw them like l shapes because they're made of a phosphate a sugar and a base and that looks a little bit like an l shape doesn't it so we draw them as these little l's so we can add some on there and some on here so these are complementary bases getting added on here now remember to say that um, they're not just bases they're whole nucleotides okay so we add complementary DNA nucleotides. Whenever we talk about complementary base pairing, always say what the pairing is. So it's C to G, and it's usually A to T, but because this is, oh yeah, and it is because, sorry, because it is DNA, so it is A to T, not the U. Um, the enzyme that does this is called DNA polymerase. Here's another difference because when we're making RNA in transcription, it's RNA polymerase, but here we're making DNA, so it's DNA polymerase. And what the polymerase is doing is it's joining the nucleotides together. Okay. Um, and then it basically just continues. So I'll unravel some more and then it will add some more bases. I'll unravel some more, add some more nucleotides, join them together and just continue until it's copied the whole lot. OK, so it is going to do the whole lot. 
Now, when the polymerase joins the nucleotides together, another detail we could add is that they're phosphodiester bonds on the backbone of the DNA. And we need to know that this process is what we call semi-conservative. And that's because if you look at the colours that I've used there, the blue is the original strand and the red is what's going to form the new strand. So as this then continues, eventually from here, we're going to end up with new double helixes that have one red strand and one blue strand. So one original strand and one new strand. And then we call that semi-conservative. If it was conservative, it would conserve two blue strands, two original strands. Um, if it were disruptive or dispersive, the red and blue would be scattered all over the place. But actually, it's called semi-conservative replication because each new DNA molecule is made of one old and one new strand of DNA. Okay, so that's called semi-conservative replication, and that's the model that we know it actually uses. Um, there's a really famous experiment that shows this, which I'll go through with you as well. So the experiment is called the Messelson and Stahl experiment. And what they did is they, first of all, grew um, bacteria in two different isotopes of nitrogen. So they used... Um, an isotope of nitrogen 15 and they used an isotope of nitrogen 14. So now if you were to put um, DNA that you that was made of nitrogen 15 it would be denser and when you put it in a centrifuge which is a machine that spins stuff and um, kind of puts it in order by density the densest heaviest stuff if you like goes to the bottom and the lightest stuff to the top so if you were to put um, some DNA in the tube in the centrifuge and spin it, nitrogen 14 and nitrogen 15 form these two bands. So nitrogen 14 is less dense, so it forms a band near the top. Nitrogen 15 is more dense, it forms a band near the bottom there. OK, so that's the kind of fundamental knowledge that we need to know before we start. So what uh, Messelson and Stahl did is they grew their bacteria in um, petri dishes and in those petri dishes um, they started off growing them in nitrogen um, 14 okay so they're growing these little bacteria in the petri dish you know on the agar jelly and in that agar jelly is a is nitrogen 14 so every time the, the bacteria divide my binary fission into two and then the two divide into four and then the four divide into eight etc yeah each time the, the bacteria divide and multiply the new dna is made of nitrogen 14 okay so at the start the dna in these bacteria is made of two strands double helix and both of those strands are nitrogen 14 okay then what they did is they had another petri dish and this time it contained nitrogen 15. So what they did is they put the bacteria from here, if we draw those red, let's say they put some of them in there and then they started to multiply and as they multiplied they started incorporating nitrogen 15 in their DNA. Okay, so originally they were all nitrogen 14, but then they started to incorporate nitrogen 15. So what they then ended up with is DNA that was half nitrogen 14 and half nitrogen 15. So let's have a look at how that kind of came about. So at the start, they grew bacteria in um, nitrogen 14 and therefore both strands of DNA were nitrogen 14. So put the steps underneath it so you could write out a method. So they grew bacteria in nitrogen 14. Um, all the DNA strands 
um, included question 14. Therefore, if they extracted the DNA and centrifuged it, nitrogen 14 is the lighter one, so it would form that band at the bottom and at the bottom of the tube, of the centrifuge tube. So if they were to put that in the centrifuge, extract the DNA, put it in a centrifuge, it would form a band near the bottom. Oh, Oh, sorry, near the top. It's the lighter one, isn't it? 14. So it formed the band near the top, nitrogen 14. Then what happened is that they moved the bacteria to the Petri dish that had nitrogen 15 in it. So they moved them after one generation into um, a Petri dish containing nitrogen 15. So then the new strand of DNA that it makes in DNA replication is made of nitrogen 15, the heavy version. 15. But the original strand will be nitrogen 14 still. Okay, so what's going to happen is we know from our DNA replication work that it will unzip at one end and we'll get new nucleotides in here. But the new ones are going to be made of nitrogen 15. Way around. So the new ones are nitrogen 15. The old ones were nitrogen 14. Okay. And that will continue all the way up that strand. And this will continue all the way up that strand. And we'll end up with DNA that's got one old strand. Because remember, it's semi-conservative. One old strand and one new strand. Okay, so it's literally half nitrogen 15 and half nitrogen 14. Now, because each strand is half nitrogen 15 and half nitrogen 14, it's actually got like a middle density. So when they extract it and centrifuge it, it forms a band in the middle. Okay, because it's nitrogen 14 and 15. One strand of each. Okay, so let's add that they need to extract it, etc. into here. So if they extract the DNA centrifuge, it forms a middle band. And then what they do after one more generation is they do exactly the same process again. So this time, these strands that are mixed will open up like this. Okay, but still in nitrogen 15, so the new strands are these green 15s. So the same thing will happen over here. So it unzips like this, but all new strands are green. I'll draw the new ones underneath. So this one is half green, half red, but this one is green and green. This one's green and green. This one's green and red. So you can see that we've got two bands going to come when we centrifuge it this time. So then they kept the, oops, kept nitrogen 15 for another generation. And again, the new strands are nitrogen 15. It's going to form two bands now. So when they extract the DNA and centrifuge it, they're going to get two bands because now we've got the band that's half red, half green, which will form a band in the middle of the centrifuge. And we've got some DNA that's just nitrogen 15, just the green, and that'll form a band at the bottom. Okay, so two bands, uh, one in the middle, and one at the bottom. Okay, so if we were to draw that, so we'd get a band in the middle for the strands that are nitrogen 14 and 15, and we get a band at the bottom for the DNA that's just nitrogen 15. And what this does is it gives us evidence 
for semi semi conservative replication because it's proving that the original strand is conserved and the new strand is new okay so it's evidence for semi conservative replication that's really important so if we go back to the heading here this okay just add on that the point of this experiment is it's evidence for the semi conservative model now the last thing is what if they ask you what would happen if it wasn't semi conservative so if it wasn't semi conservative then we still start with the nitrogen 14 so we could still start with two 14s 14 14 giving a band at the top we'd move it into the nitrogen 15 but what would happen if it was conservative replication is one of the double helices would stay two old strands and the new one would be two 15s, two new strands. And so at this point, when you extract it in the DNA and put it in the centrifuge, what you'd actually end up is with a 14 band and a 15 band. Um, whereas here, after one generation, They've got one old, one new, and you just get the band in the middle. Okay, so you get different results. So if it was conservative replication, you'd end up with this because it fully conserves the old and then there's a new. Whereas this is semi-conservative because we've got one old, one new. Okay, and that finishes that spec point.